but this is from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18, right towards the end of the letter to the Hebrews. And we jump in at verse 18 where it's referring back to um, Moses in the Old Testament where he met God on the mountain. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom and storm, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terif terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to be with you again. Last time I was here, there was about three of us, and the rest of you were all at home in your pyjamas, drinking cups of tea, watching it on your computer. So it's good that you're all here today. When I was growing up, a career that was open to everyone was to work as a railway station attendant, sweep the station, collect the tickets, and just generally hang around seemed to be the sum total of the job. I once had a thoughtful railway station attendant hose around me as I was trying to sleep on a bench on Port Augusta railway station. It was a long story while I was doing that, but I was hitchhiking to Perth with a friend and we got in a car and nearly got killed and decided we'd catch the train instead. Hence, we were on a railway station. Those days of station attendance are long gone. Now there are stations with no attendance at all. It's a sad thing and it's probably a bad thing for society. Up until a couple of years ago, working with computers was the way to go. Later, it was working with artificial intelligence if you had the skills to do that in the first place. These days, the skills that are valued in our society are healthcare workers, transport workers, and shop assistants. And to show how much society values them, we pay them the least. There are some jobs that last, jobs that we'll always need, doctors, nurses, and there are some jobs that don't last, but that's only thinking about jobs in this world. What sort of jobs might last into eternity? Please note that I don't think that any jobs will actually last into eternity, but let's just pretend for the sake of the fun of it. There are some jobs that won't be needed at all in heaven. Can you suggest any? Doctors, won't need doctors in heaven. Anything else? So, police, yep. Parking attendant, judges, cleaners, used car salesmen, all sorts of things. Yes, salesmen. What about jobs that might last into eternity, if jobs did last into eternity? What sort of jobs would, would fit in with what we know will be in heaven? Can you suggest any? Yes. Chefs. That was going to be my ultimate point. <laughs> Never work with a congregation and children. Gardeners. Yeah, I had musicians, but that'll do. Gardeners, musicians, and chefs. So keep that in the back of your mind. What sort of jobs might there be in heaven if there were jobs in heaven? Uh, chefs. Running alongside that idea of chefs, 
and meal, the things that they prepare, meals and feasts, is the idea that it can be hard to go on if we're not sure that it's worthwhile going on. Some jobs are hard. One Christmas vacation, I had a job as a bacon washer in a small goods factory. If you want to know what a bacon washer does, you can ask me later and you might regret it afterwards. It's probably a job that doesn't exist anymore. When I was working on that job, I counted down the days until the job would end. Sometimes I counted down half days of until the job would end. How I would have coped if I wasn't able to count down the days, and I've had to count down years, I dread to think. Some of the guys in the factory were clearly not happy. One bloke had a table and his job was to cut up the bits of meat. And he wielded a very sharp knife and he spent every hour of every day cutting away at the meat and swearing. And I used to go out of my way to go out of his way. In some jobs, perhaps many jobs, people cope by counting down the years till their retirement, till the job can end and they can retire and the pleasure can begin. For many, that's a fleeting pleasure, if that. They either don't make it to retirement, their partner doesn't, their health has failed, they don't have the resources that they thought they'd have, whether that's the Winnebago lifestyle or the international travelling. And even if they do make it to retirement with the resources and the health that they need, there's the worry and then the reality that it won't last for more than a few years. But the Christian shouldn't have, doesn't need to have, the same limited dreams of a few years, perhaps, of pleasure. The Christian doesn't need to have the same limited hopes, the same limited pleasure. As Christians, we know and we should realise that our future is glorious and unlimited. We're already familiar with the idea that in heaven there'll be no more tears or suffering. And while that's true and glorious and much to be desired, it's the end of a negative. It's the end of tears and pain. They're things that won't be there. The Christian faith has a lot more to say about life with God, about the things that will be there, not just the things that won't be there, but the things that will be there, about the great positives. And one of those great positives is the idea of feasting, of the wedding banquet, of meals, of eating. Sometimes our meals are pretty basic, simple food simply for nourishment and eaten alone. But other meals stand out in our memories. I think Dave's been encouraging you to think about meals that stand out in your memory for the last few weeks. Does anyone have a suggestion, a thought about a meal that stood out for them in their lifetime? Go for it. Christmas with the family? Any particular one? Why does it stand out? Everyone was there. Yep. Any other meals that stand out? Yep. Yep. A spur of the moment, getting together and enjoying that. Okay. Okay. So an 80th birthday party with everybody there. You noticed any 
link in those three comments together. So it's, it's the eating, it's the meal, and it's the together as well. One more? Yep. Family reunion. Okay. You guys are all good because you're all remembering the, um, the positive togetherness. Um, some of the meals that I remember have to actually deal with the food. Um, so I have a few memories of meals. Um, some of them are negative. There was a Chinese restaurant in a country town about three years ago. I hadn't realised it was possible to mess up an omelette. It is. I didn't know you could do it. But what you do is you cook an omelette, you put it on a plate, and then you cover it with a really, really, really thick soy sauce corn flour thing so that when you turn the plate on the side, everything stays. That stands out in my mind. There was a hamburger in Eden, which I threw away. There was a meal in Chicago where we sat down and there were these two people sitting at a table and they both had bulletproof vests on and they both had really, really big guns sitting on the table in front of them. And I said to the guy we were with, who are these guys? And he said, I think they're undercover police. And I said, I don't think they look very undercover to me. Then there are the really positive memories of meals that I have. There was a meal at an Indian restaurant in Melbourne in about 1981, stands out in my mind. There was a meal by the side of a dusty road on a school geology excursion. It was just some nice bread that we'd bought in Mudgee, some nice butter, some cheese and some tomatoes, and it was just great. There was a meal on Quato Island in Papua New Guinea, where I was for a reenactment ceremony of when the first missionaries came there. That stands out in my mind. Meals, food, drink, being with other people as we share those things are gifts from God. That's clear throughout Scripture. He provided manna in the wilderness, and we pray for our daily bread. And throughout the Bible, there are numerous meals that are mentioned. In the Garden of Eden, we know that there are fruit trees, just as there will be in heaven, presumably so that the fruit could be eaten at a meal. In fact, God spoke to Adam and Eve and the animals about what they could eat as food. There's a list of it there that you can see in Genesis 1. Deuteronomy speaks about the meals and the parties that were to be enjoyed by the people on a regular basis. What did you do with your tithe? You went and bought food and you had a party with it. Families had parties together. Neighbours had parties together. Communities had parties together. You invited the poor. You invited the priests. You invited the Levites. Everyone got together regularly and had a feast. At the wedding at Cana, in John's Gospel, we can read about Jesus contributing to the feast by turning water into wine, the best wine. Luke 12, 35, 40 tells us of the meal, one of the many meals that Jesus attended, and we read about Jesus attending a lot of meals. If I can digress from my notes just for a moment, which I will. Um, it's an important passage because one of the people at the meal says, oh, wouldn't it be fantastic if I was just acceptable enough to be able to eat at the meal in heaven? And he was referring to the passage in Isaiah 25, which I'll come to in a minute. He was referring to that because the Jews at the time had some funny ideas about that passage. They turned it around from being an invitation for everybody to being an invitation almost for nobody. So that the Qumran community thought that only Jews would be able to go to this building. And there was a well-known rabbi at the time who thought that it wasn't just Jews who would be able to go into heaven. You had to be a Jew who didn't have any blemish. So if you were blind, you had no hearing, had a bad leg, you were maimed, whatever it might happen to be, you didn't qualify. 
The only people who qualified were people who were full, healthy, bodied Jews. So for Jesus to say, go out and get anybody, was a really big statement. A very famous meal was what we know as the Last Supper, his last meal before his crucifixion. We know he had at least one meal with his disciples after his resurrection. What was that one? What was the one that we definitely know that he had after his resurrection? The breakfast on the beach. Yep. When he was at the Last Supper, Jesus told his disciples that he wouldn't drink wine again until he drank it new with you, his disciples, in my Father's kingdom. There are those words in Isaiah 25. Some of the words in Isaiah 25, verses 6 to 9, we're very familiar with because they occur later in the Bible. It says, he will swallow up death forever and the Lord God will wipe, wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken. But the passage begins with the description of a meal in verse 6. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of fat things, a feast of wine on the leaves, of fat things full of marrow, of wine on the leaves well refined. I don't know about you, but I'll give up the fat things full of marrow and wait for the dessert. But you get the idea. It will be a great feast. And that idea is continued in Hebrews 12 that was read to us by George a few minutes ago, where it says that we haven't come to Mount Zion, a place of terror, a place of darkness. We meet as believers with God at Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, and it's a time of festival. Did you read from the NIV, George? The NIV, I think, said it's a time of joyful something. What does it say? Joyful assembly. Well, my RSV, the really reliable version, um, says that it's a festal gathering. It's a time of festivity. No gloom, just a time of festival, festing, feasting. Then in Revelation 19.9, we read about the wedding feast in heaven. So there's a consistent line in Scripture from Genesis to Revelation where eating and feasting plays a role. What is there about feasting and meals that makes them so important? I want to talk about what a meal symbolises. And this whole topic is very hard for me to describe and this bit in particular. There's a joke coming up and I hope that you all laugh. In choosing to speak on this topic, I've probably bitten off more than I can chew. Oh, good. I was a bit worried that no one would laugh. I hope some of you people at home laughed. It's hard to describe this feast because I'll be using words to describe a feast and it can't really be done because feasting isn't just about words. There will be lots of talk and there will be lots of laughter but a feast is also about what we see and feel. It's about excitement. It's about movement. Hustle and bustle, it's about smells. It's about touch. It's about taste. It's about embracing old friends and rejoicing in meeting new friends. A feast is a sensory experience. And to just talk about it, it's just grey, whereas a, a feast is multicoloured. It's all colours. So as we think about feasts, try to use your imagination and smell and taste and see as well as hear. So what does a meal symbolise? In PNG, if someone says, let's meet, what they're saying is, let's eat together. Eating and sharing a meal signifies the end of a hunger. Not just a physical hunger, but in heaven it can be used as a symbol, as an end of a hunger for God, the bread of life image. 
Eat this bread and you'll never be hungry again. Have this relationship with God and you'll never be alone again. You'll never be on the outside looking in. That's what we're going to do in a few minutes' time. We're going to take these symbols and they're going to be about two sorts of hungers, that physical hunger but also about that spiritual hunger. It will be a sign that we're in fellowship with God, that we're outside. With a meal, there's the pleasure of the food itself, not the hamburger from the cafe in Eden, but the positive pleasures, the Indian meal in Melbourne, a school excursion meal by the side of a dusty road, plucking a mango off a tree and eating it, and then another one and perhaps even another one. There's pleasure in the company, the fellowship, the end of loneliness. Many of us have to eat alone, and it can get very discouraging, very lonely, even depressing day after day. You can't have a gathering at a feast without having a gathering. You need people gathered together. And as you people have shared already, the meals that stand out in your mind are the gatherings. There's pleasure sometimes in the lead up to the meal, the preparation, the anticipation of the meal. You think about it in advance. Hooray, in a couple of weeks, the family's getting together. I'll see people that I love that I haven't seen for a while. In some communities, the gathering of people from different generations to prepare a meal is greatly valued. The grandchild learning from the grandparent. There's pleasure in a meal which marks an end to hostility between people. There's been some sort of fraction and people ease that disharmony by eating together. There's pleasure in stepping back from work, having a wash, sitting down, something to eat and drink, the end of a task, either for the day or the end of a task for good. So those are some of the things we can look forward to, an end to the task for God and for us. It will truly be the seventh day, the day of rest, when God and his creation gather in peace and everything will be right. Not that God has been struggling in this battle. The path to victory and the final victory have never been in doubt. There's never been any straying from that path to victory, but we've been struggling. But then there'll be no more struggling against the evil one. It's been, it is hard for us even though the outcome has never been in doubt. Our books are in the book of life. We're safe in the hands of our Heavenly Father. For now, in this world, we gather around the Lord's Supper in a symbolic manner. Then in heaven, we'll gather around with one another together in person with God. Full open fellowship with God no more seeing in a glass dimly, then we'll see God face to face. When this great heavenly feast takes place, God is seated, Christ is seated, the last enemy death has been defeated, and we too are seated. When we sit down to that feast, it will mean that Satan is totally, permanently defeated. When we sit down to that feast, it will mean that God is totally, permanently triumphant. When we sit down to that feast, it will mean that our salvation is totally, permanently complete. When we sit down to that feast, it will mean that Christ is totally and permanently victorious. When we'll sit down to that feast, it will mean that our rest is totally and permanently total and permanent. No more pain, no more tears, no more death, no more separation, just feasting and pleasure 
and God showing his immeasurable kindness of his riches towards us in Christ Jesus. Every day, something special. Every day, something new. Is all of this just a sop to keep people tied to the church? Is this pie in the sky, literally pie in the sky, when you die stuff? Yes. Yes, it is. But that doesn't mean that it's untrue. There can be pie in heaven when you die. Is this teaching just something to keep you going? Yes, yes, it is. But that doesn't mean it's untrue. Is this teaching just something to encourage you to stay close to God? Yes, yes, it is. But that doesn't mean that it's untrue. It's not untrue. It's all true. How do we know that it's true? The resurrection of Jesus, of course. Jesus is risen from the dead. On Friday, the tomb was full. And on Sunday morning, Jewish, Roman and Christian writers all agree it was empty. Jesus rose from the dead. It is all true. There will be a feast in heaven. If you're unsure about that, then speak to Dave or to Stu or one of the elders or someone else you feel comfortable talking with. The God who acts consistently and honourably and justly throughout history, the God who never lies, tells us that it's true. There will be a feast. There's been a lot of trauma over the past few years. 2019 has gone, that normal has gone, and what the future will hold, perhaps more trauma, who knows? For many people, though, trauma is a part of their lives, even without COVID. I have a friend who's a psychologist, and he told me once that a client said that COVID had been great for him because now everyone is distressed and anxious as he is all of the time. But one thing we know, the future is ultimately in God's hands and a great meal is waiting. How will the world end? Or perhaps I should ask, how will eternity begin? Is it worth going on? Is it worth persevering? It is. It will end with a banquet. Eternity begins with a feast and everyone is invited. When I lived in Bega, I was told about a lady who used to always carry around a spoon. When asked why she did it, she said that it was because when she went to heaven, she knew there'd be a feast, and at the end of the feast, there'd be dessert, and she wanted to be ready. Heaven probably supplies cutlery, but let's be ready and eager. Jesus told a parable about how some people will find various excuses to not attend a feast. The feast will last forever. Those people who decline the invitation will miss out forever. That's a big call. Guess who's invited you to a feast? God has. The smell, the sights, the talk, the excitement, the taste, the fellowship, the gathering, and you don't have to go home. The invitation is for everyone and anyone who would like to attend, even us, even you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you care for us. We thank you for Jesus, and we thank you for this great invitation to sit at table with you. Amen.